Hello and welcome everyone. Wonderful to be with you all today. My name is Evan Easton Calabria. I'm a senior research officer at the Refugee Studies Center. I'm convening this term seminar series on localizing refugee research and practice. And I have the deep honor to introduce today senior researcher, Dr. Christina, Lips excuse me, Christina Lipstraw, as if I don't speak German, don't speak it enough, um, from Bochum University. She's based at the Institute for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict. And before I turn it over to you, Christina, I have two things. One for the audience, a bit of housekeeping. You'll see that the chat function is disabled, but you have the opportunity at any point to type in a question. And once Christina is done talking, we'll, um, I'll moderate the Q&A and try to stay as true to your questions as possible. And I also just wanted to say an extra thanks to you, Christina, because I was reflecting on when I first came across your work at um, on a particularly hot and dusty day in Arua, Uganda. And it was at a time when a colleague and I were really trying to make sense of some of what we were seeing around us. And this term critical localism um, filled in a gap for us, for sure. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you and reemerge in a bit. Thank you, Evan, very much uh, for this kind of invitation and also introduction. I have to uh, give that back because I recently wrote an article that I came across that work you then published and it very made total sense uh, for my own field research. So uh, there's a full circle here. I'm now um, opening my PowerPoint and share it with you. And we'll start my talk. So I'm talking about critical localism today and I want to reflect on the localization of humanitarian action and theory, in theory and research practice. Um, so I will talk about my own research that I have conducted on the localization agenda and in humanitarian action and also want to reflect on how I applied it in the context of forced migration. In my talk today, because I just don't know if everyone is familiar with the localization agenda I just ref, uh, referred to. So I will say a few words about localizing humanitarian action before I introduce critical localism as a research framework. Um, I will give a short, very brief overview of the research I conducted um, that was in Italy and Bangladesh to so already let you know what I'm talking about. And I will um, reflect uh, on the research and the research practice. So starting with the localization of humanitarian action, so some of you might be uh, familiar with that. Um, so there is this, um, well, first of all, maybe to set things clear when we talk about humanitarian action, there's a lot of discussion going on what that actually is. Just for this uh, talk, I will say, I will focus on the service delivery in emergency situations to save lives and alleviate suffering. And uh, there is a whole sector, international sector, that we see being involved in these kind of situations. And um, in 2015, you see on the right hand side, there's the World Disasters Report already kind of focused on the role of local actors in um, service delivery in emergency situations. They pointed out the importance of, human, um, of local actors. Um, and then um, in 2016, we had the World Humanitarian Summit and before the Humanitarian Summit, but especially during and after the Humanitarian Summit, the localization as such as a word, as a concept became a buzzword in the humanitarian sector. There were general international commitments coming out of it, such as the Grand Bargain and the Agenda for Humanity, but also the Charter for Change with um, you know, all of them acknowledging the central role of local actors in all phases of a humanitarian response and with the aim to strengthen, strengthen these actors um, with a belief that this would address shortcomings of current system and current um, intervention practices um, by, for example, increasing aid and effectiveness, but also addressing power imbalance prevalent in the humanitarian sector, which is considered, you know, as a yeah, as a um, sector where a handful of international actors dominate. Now, having said that, um, of course, there were already earlier at the earlier stages. Um, some, sorry, <laughs> um, 
efforts to you know stress the role of uh, local actors. So I found this uh, diagram by ICWA very interesting because we talk about localization and as I said it became a buzzword in 2015, 16 mainly and has since has been since then and kind of you know informing current reform efforts. But when you look at it, this graph that shows the evolution evolution of localization in international policy when it comes to humanitarian action, you see that since the 90s latest, there yeah, there were these efforts and it's enshrined the you know the, the role of local actors is acknowledged and is also enshrined in several of these documents. For example, you see in 2003 here the yeah, the good humanitarian donorship. Um, general principles and um, here the Sunday framework for disaster risk reduction. So there are several documents that have already um, established that. But now we have this impetus uh, since the World Humanitarian Summit. The question remains what localization actually means. Uh, what does that entail? So the Charter for Change um, is mainly uh, you know, um, cooperation of and signed by uh, NGOs um, versus the Grand Bargain, which is more like a donor initiative, has uh, identified these uh, eight dimensions um, that I show you here um, that encompass localization. So there is, for example, the issue of direct funding, the commitment to uh, pass 25% of humanitarian funding to national local actors, NGOs here. Uh, partnership to really uh, reaffirm the principles of partnership, partnership, um, you know, equal partnerships, transparency, but also recruitment mechanisms. Um, for example, we have that often discussed that there is, um, you know, the negative impact of recruiting national and local NGO staff by international ones, so kind of poaching going on. So this should be addressed, advocacy, um, equality, support also by capacity development and building, um, but also the promotion and visibility because um, there's also this uh, um, this uh, claim that you know local actors are often not visible, although they're the ones that are actually implementing projects on the ground. They're often not made visible in annual reports or something. So there should be more like you know in the media like more visibility of these actors. Okay, so of course uh, there are various aspects to that and um, you know people are like there's an ongoing discussion uh, how localization could look like um, but these are some of the main um, main dimensions like funding and uh, partnership and organizational structures. As we can see from that the localization agenda how I would call it and has been called requires a wide range of changes of how the humanitarian sector works. However, there exists little consensus on the definition of the local or how to implement localization in practice. I mean, we have seen this dimension, but how is that going to be translated into practice is still a question. Yeah? Um, so with that kind of background, I started my own research uh, and I looked at that agenda like, uh, and got really interested in uh, the entire discourse on localization. And what I found is that there was a confused understanding of the local in well, scholarship. I would say there was hardly enough scholarship on that at that time, um, policy and practice. And the, this, why do I call it confused? And I will say more about that in a second, but it was not clear who the local is, which is quite important, not from a conceptual, only from a conceptual analytical perspective, but also because, for example, resources are going to be channeled through that to that actors, and they should be empowered. So, who are these actors that are, should receive that monies, and who should be empowered? That remains a question. Yeah? And this understanding that it was very prevalent in many of the documents I found was drawing upon a binary between the local and the international, thereby also with a tendency to ascribe certain qualities to these actors, which of course has implication for humanitarian practice. Um, so the question that remains <laughs> for me was actually what or where is the local? 
And this is definitely something also the humanitarian sector is discussing broadly. There are some, you know, um, some suggestions of how this should be um, you know, defined. When we look at it, I've made these boxes here. We can often see that there are like these labels, like the international, for, all, for example, we often see international actors are considered foreign governments, international governmental organizations, international non-governmental organizations, so that have international outreach, but also sometimes academic institutions, think tanks, and the private sector. So, you know, having like more like a global scope versus the local. Um, where and the list is a bit longer here, uh, that's not by intention or it's not saying that there are more actors uh, subsumed under this category, but it's not quite clear who these actors are. So there's like national governments, local government representatives, national local non-governmental organizations. When you recall the Charter for Change diagram I, I showed you, the green one, yeah, where it said it actually was talking about local NGOs as local actors. Uh, uh, and actually they say in the documents, local NGOs from the global south. Yeah? So this is a definition of a local actor, which maybe um, does not entail all the actors we can think of. Um, other civil society actors that might not all be organized in that way. Um, the question is, what about national or local staff of foreign NGOs, you know, international NGOs, the private sector, community-based act, um, act, actions yeah? and also very much contested is the question about internationally affiliated organizations so like the you know, um, Red Cross and Red Crescent societies at the national level I mean should they be considered local or international so it's not that clear so we try to put them into neat boxes but once you look into it yeah, you realize it's not that clear so this um, is one of the things I was looking into and uh, was wondering about, especially as I said, this has repercussions for humanitarian practice. So I then um, identified some problems. Then you see there's a lot on the slides. So I saw a lot of problems there. Um, I have written an article that's the one Evan was talking about earlier, um, which is called a, reflect, a call for critical reflection on the localization agenda and humanitarian action on which this talk and also especially this theoretical um, reflection is based on. So the problem I was seeing uh, and that was very interesting for me also is being also familiar with peace building, critical peace building scholarship, I, I found it very fascinating how we had such a vibrant critical discourse on the local conceptualizations on the, of the local in development cooperation before in peace building scholarship and practice, but this was not used for further insights in the humanitarian field. So I started digging into that and uh, especially um, the so-called second local turn in critical peace building scholarship was very, um, in, yeah, very um, insightful. Yeah? So I, I made most of the use of that. Uh, you have scholars uh, such as McGinty, or um, there's Bräuchler, there's some, uh, there is a lot of, you know, like you see here on the slides, Sabaratnam, but also Pafenholz that could be linked to that second local turn, which is very much inspired by post-colonial thinking and post-structuralist thinking also in the construction of the local. Um, and they already identified some problems with that when we talk about the local and if, if you have this binary, like, shook the position of the local versus the international. So it's there it says like this, the essentialization of the local and the international that is on the basis of an underlying ontological distinction that juxtaposes the global north as the international, universal, modern, technocratic, and the global south as the local, particular, traditional, parochial, and there is a tendency then to either romanticize or vilify the local. So we have this, you know, for example, a kind of tendency to romanticize, let's say, indigenous knowledge uh, uh, versus like debates on the corrupt 
local elites or something like that going on. I'm not saying it's very explicit in the localization discourse, but when you look into it, there are tendencies of that. Yeah? Um, this, as Sarparatnam has shown in her uh, text on the avatars of Eurocentrism, that's why I have this avatars here, um, this risks um, re reproducing certain colonial thought patterns and that see the global north as a starting point for analysis. Yeah, so that's how humanitarian action should look like. Um, or that's the thing, yeah, that's what we start from. And then discuss and analyze everything else. So there's this danger of doing that. So the local being juxtaposed to the international. Of course, it's also oversimplification of any humanitarian context as we have already talked, because I mean, yeah, what about local staff in international organizations? Um, what about this uh, internationally affiliated organizations? I mean, where to draw the line? Uh, um, and also, this all leads, uh, as also Paffenholz has argued, to blind spots in our analysis with a focus on Western international actors, because that's normally what we do. It's like, okay, we criticize the Western international actors that bypass the local ones, um, which then leads to blindness towards dominant local or non-Western international elites. You know? So this is something that has been worked out in critical peace building scholarship. And I use that um, insights for my own research on the localization agenda. So that led me to the critical localism concept, which is definitely not coined by me, but um, I found McGinty's work on that very insightful and he calls for critical localism. Um, in he works out how this, the concept as a, uh, of the local which should be understood more as something highly contextual and relational, allows for an analysis, analysis of the very processes by which the local is constructed. So there's a recon within this critical localism framework for research, yeah, there's a reconceptualization of the local as a complex conception of the everyday and space of action within webs of power and politics in which different actors operate and interact in a humanitarian set. Yeah. Um, then that leads to questions, who claims actually to represent the local, who defines who the local is, and how this may lead to the marginalization of certain actors in the humanitarian arena. So that maybe becomes a bit uh, clearer once I speak about um, the, how I've implemented this in, in, in research practice. Now, it's maybe not so visible here, the text, but I ended with the word of the humanitarian arena. So I combined this idea of a critical localism yeah, that also looks at this translocal entanglements of actors um, and kind of combined it uh, to the concept of the idea of the humanitarian arena because it kind of lends itself to that idea. Because when we think about the agency space for actors within the humanitarian sector, we often talk about the humanitarian space for the operation. Yeah? Um, we can think of it as an arena in which actors seek to gain legitimacy and access to the affected populations and generate thereby, I would argue, certain practices of inclusion and exclusion. I mean, who has access to the affected population, who is not? There's a struggle, and that's why this arena you, uh, arena you see here, people fighting about it. This space it should not be understood as fe merely physical, but it's also a symbolic space, and it is um, a discursive construct for social action. So I kind of combined the two um, and applied that to my own research um, on local humanitarian action in the context of forced migration. So for that, I was first looking into the more theoretical aspect, um, the localization discourse, I worked out these things, and I applied it to the Mediterranean context. I worked on Italy, mainly Lampedusa and Sicily, and uh, in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh um, in the context of the Rohingya response. I used the critical localism as a theoretical framework with the humanitarian arena approach and interface analysis to see how the actors interacted and related in this competitive humanitarian arena. And methodologically, I won't go into detail here, but if you have questions later, I'm happy to respond to that. 
I would call it ethnographic inspired methods because I did not conduct uh, a full ethnography um, or ethnographic study, but certainly also did some participant observation and this kind of things. So just to share a few thoughts on it, I have, I'm, I'm happy to respond to more questions about uh, this later. Um, Italian context was a bit difficult. I mean, yes, you could look at local Omanitian actors, but I was also doing the research against the backdrop of the localization agenda. So the interesting fa uh, fact here was that localization was not something people were thinking about because for one thing, Italy was not considered like, it was not considered really a humanitarian response in the same way, like in Bangladesh, um, which is another thing maybe to discuss later. Um, so, and so also the people that were involved um, and I conducted interviews with and I hang out with, uh, for example, some activists or some NGOs, they consider themselves more as human rights activists rather than humanitarian actors. Actually, they did not want to be considered humanitarian actors. So they were not aware of the humanitarian sector's discussion of that localization agenda. Having said that, the interesting thing is I found similar dynamics than, um, in, in Bangladesh. And uh, for me, it was very important to look in a case from the global north and the global south, just to bridge it a bit, because as we saw, like why should local actors only be supported in um, you know, certain settings? Maybe also they're marginalized within other contexts. So. Um, so what I saw also there that was a lot of segregation and entanglement of actors going on. It was not clear who the local was and there was like also discussions of who was the legitimate representative of the local community, which was the host community on Lampedusa, for example, but it also showed entanglements of different actors and um, how close they were with other actors like, let's say, um, maybe translocal actors, you could argue, um, like activists, but also maritime search and rescue organizations um, and national NGOs that were more aligned with the activists. So it was uh, got a bit messy. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing was then for me, the moment of disembarkation um, that when you know the search and rescue organizations came with a boat or they both came by themselves and that kind of the port became a space where you could really see that segregation and uh, inter entanglement of actors the power relations between them and um, interestingly also how certain actors were not only marginalized but used uh, or claimed the space to challenge dominant humanitarian practices. Now in Bangladesh it was more straightforward because when I conducted research there actually the localization agenda was very much a contentious issue. Uh, local NGOs or the, like the NGOs that claim to represent the local actors we actually calling for its implementation. There was a lot of debate going on, conflict actually going on, leading even to physical attacks. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, tension between so-called international actors and the local actors. Um, in the interviews, um, they were often referred to as the local, the very local, the very, very local, the more local. So there was a whole thing about who's the local. Um, and also there were different ideas on how localization then should be implemented in practice. It was quite interesting to see this dynamics. I'm happy to speak more about that later. What was definitely clear is that um, being local became a resource. Yeah? And people claimed to represent their local because that would also empower them in, you know, against the background of localization agenda. Behind all those issues um, was, and that's what I argue in the other paper I have put here on the slide, um, was a deep-seated trust issue. And I found that quite interesting because it has been argued that we need to have localization in order to um, build trust in the humanitarian sector. Uh, what I found more is like we have no localization unless we have trust because there was so much, you know, going on that localization was not implemented because I think there was also a lack, uh, lack of trust between the actors. That's very short, but I want to say is um, using this critical localism as a research framework really allowed me and was very fruitful for me to 
ask certain questions, for example, who defines the local, who are these actors, how is it defined? So that was uh, in Bangladesh quite clear. It was um, like an issue that was brought up also by the organizations themselves. In Italy, that was not really an overt issue, but it came there out in many of the talks. Um, and it also showed how being local became a resource in a competitive uh, humanitarian arena. And these local actors that claimed uh, to represent the local were actually functioning almost like gatekeepers you know, um, for access to people to the population. Yeah. Also, I would argue that this critical localism enabled me to a more profound analysis of existing power struggles that were going on and also exclusionary practices the localization agenda actually wants to address. So by limiting it to certain actors, you know, like coming with a predisposed understanding of who the local is, there is also another issue. And I think that speaks to this lecture series as well, because what I found, especially in Bangladesh, is that actually the refugee-led humanitarian action was actually a blind spot. I mean, no one was um, looking at that or them as local humanitarian actors that could maybe profit from it. So maybe the forced migration context is very particular because the national local NGOs, uh, most of the time, as was in Bangladesh, a representation of the host community and also due to government restrictions uh, refugees could not um, you know establish NGOs or something or profit from that so they were not uh, considered actors which is interesting and is something that could really work out how they were not part of the constructed local in that particular setting the same in Italy. You know? um, and I want to conclude, I'm looking at the time, I think I'm good in time, um, on a few words which we can definitely explore a little bit in more depth uh, in our discussion. It's reflections on my research practice on a different level because um, I have to say, and this is on my personal note, that uh, during this process of conducting the research, there I had some ethical dilemmas and you maybe could also call it a crisis um, of how I conducted research. So there were issues of power and representation coming up and um, I had to reflect on my own role as a researcher going there, um, working on local humanitarian actors. Also the question is how I thereby constructed the local um, and also how I maybe have also my research contributed to the blind spot of refugee-led humanitarian action. Um, but there were also other issues like, for example, with the methodologies that might not be particular to that uh, topic, but maybe more the methods that I used. For example, how I was in Italy um, ending with the participant observation ending, helping at a disembarkation. And I felt very uncomfortable with the role because it was like working alongside the local, local actors, but it was there in a capacity as a scholar. So would I use that scene? Would I use that experience for my own research? So there was also a certain bias towards maybe the certain activists because I had my own political opinion on the issue. So there was this academic hat and the activist hat that I was a little uncomfortable with, which led me then to the question in both cases, because I definitely did not want to, to also undermine, undermine the struggle for you know more um, agency space of local humanitarian actors in, in Bangladesh. So how do I represent my findings without doing any harm? And uh, so after some reflection, I thought like, okay, I really should give them more direct voice somehow. I spoke to um, you know the people I um, had interacted with, and we came up with a plan, especially in Italy. Mm, they suggested of how I could uh, continue. That was planned for 2020, you know what happened. So there was a whole set for me of other ethical uh, issues, so I could not travel there. Um, but also then I decided not to bother people um, who struggled with COVID-19 themselves uh, in both settings uh, with my own research agenda. And that's also the question, who actually benefits from the research? So 
co-production of knowledge was an issue, but also how could there be a more decolonial research ethics and how could I implement that in my own research practice, which I would say I did not <laughs> end up doing. And I'm still looking for ways of doing that in future um, to have look into this discussion, but also, um, yeah, uh, contribute to a more decolonial approach here. I want to end with this line and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to our uh, continuation of the discussion now and to hear about your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. I will appear shortly. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I was taking notes. 